that I wrote a number of years ago uh, that uh, expresses some sort of relationship between a poet and his subject. Very likely, it is all that we see and say it is. All of the accoutrements, the chunks of red sun fuming at the threat of suffocation under purple clouds, the gaudy plumage for the most somber of occasions. It knows that we know it and feels understood. It wants to love us, but doesn't know how. It reaches out after our turned backs and then withdraws its tentative caress bites its lip with its wanting us to tell all about what we understand, what we see. <clears throat> so, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to introduce Josh Smith. Just the people who've heard these, although it's presumptuous to say people would remember. <laughs> um, I'm working on a series called Dancing in the Dark, a sequel to Consciousness Suite. This one begins by a line from Captain Ahab, I am darkness leaping out of the A leap of cosmic faith of, uh, in a new vision or very old, curtailed by those who commandeered the light, redirected its beams to mean projects, twisting faith into mere belief in the paltry, the poverty of endless hegemonic war, starry veer co-opted so, of greed, even sacred sperm soul. His vision played out in the city's cathedral, his sacramental act leaving lurid white scar, and then the vision of naught beyond, before he dropped one sweet tear, refusing to yield his vast faith in depths of darkness, faith in galaxies beyond the owner's dimlit minds. That's the This one begins with Emerson. Literature is a point outside our hodiernal circle through which a new one may be described. The use of literature is to afford us a platform whence we may command the view of our present life, a purchase by which we may move it. At that point, absolute zero. But as the description forms the new circle, oh, we warm to the task to each other as the circles old and new intersect or touch, galactic vibrations cascade across the stretch of space. To arrive at a new point, another description, a platform yet more distant, a broader view from which, finally, perhaps, there may be leverage to cipher and move us from ground zero to what? And so moved have we ground to stand upon. Oh, love, is there time? And when is zero hour? Shall we be grounded or float weightlessly into oblivion? <laughs> I'm wearing out my knee getting out of them, but that's okay. I'm having a new one put in. A, the 19th of December, I thought I'd give you all something to celebrate <clears throat> at this time of year. Um, Lauren Frank. Listen very carefully. I'm no good for you, but still I look so made for you. Your arm curled round my waist, it feels just about right, holding me not too tight. But still I feel a pull to leave, to explore the floor beneath our feet or the clouds covering the sun from our eyes. I want to break away and spend my days becoming smaller, part of a bigger fantasy. 
but you hold me there against your ribs. And I think I could live like this. <laughs> Next one is a little longer. Calculating pensive thoughts. Rain. Water collides with concrete outside my window, hearing it without strain. A comforting sound. I'm glad to be inside, dry, Neighboring gleaming trees. In the distance, squares of yellow light glow on the side of a house. I let my thoughts float on a lazy river, passing memories slowly, frequently dozing like this. Relaxed in solitude and damn near silence, I enjoy this company. I close my eyes again, picturing you, the only intruder I would allow to share this space and divide the time with me. Confused between images of your face in sunlight and quilted darkness, the closeness I recall, eyes inches from mine, our lips rejoicing, summoning the courage to touch. The sky overflows. I see us making love. John Marvin. Poems are inspired, if somewhat obliquely, by Jack Spicer, Robin Blazer, and Robert Duncan. Liquid runoff. In the darkness of an enchanted forest, sound absorbed by foliage and echoes swallowed up in leaf litter, fallen twigs, branches, even trees matured, flourished, and descended to the floor. In this shadowy domain, light filters down to mingle with moisture and decomposition. Never saw so drear, so rank, so arduous, a wilderness seeming silent, yet so full of sound. When you stand as quiet as possible, breathing just enough with gentleness you never knew. Then you hear rustles of tiny moving things and air pushing across stems vibrating the content. Neither sacred Celtic Nordic Deccan groves rhythmically intoning casting spells, nor holy forests singing a lifetime full of synthesis, continuity, image nations, nor Pisan grandeur <coughs> chanting unconfessed regret for Nuovo Roman power felled and forsaken, bending the fabric of space into trickles and gird, girdles sounding like a distant fire, embering hollow moss-covered logs having served as canopy and floor, leaving now an opening for rain to reach the trickle that feeds the roar of waves upon the shore. Who the fuck is Jack Spicer? <laughs> oh, you have fallen down on your head. You have fallen on your head, Jack Spicer. Dictation isn't all it's cracked up to be, beyond imagination, beyond subconscious infiltration, beyond a hairy epidermis where otherness begins its slow condensation, its slow conglomeration, its slow concatenation. It's so slow. It might make your head swim across 
never an ocean, just a sea at least when questioned for some holy grail or any hunting arrow determined to cascade in a particular ballistic trajectory, regardless of past syllables, stabbing melodies, and vital organs of musical content lamenting in a minor key, a blues sonnet called We Groan a Wail While Our Sail Inflates Like a Bagpipe Fife Tatting, Tap Dancing, and Farting like some worried extraterrestrial during a suburban midnight that some people think is Sumatra, but those in the know are not convinced of the need for encounters with Cerberus, for example, eating my meat as if someone could be a sojourner in death's realm where one who would whisper twists through a drunken poet's pencil, a drunken dreaming poet who, like Lorca, writes no more but maybe whispers outward in his turn. The final of our, or the last of our open readers is Mommy J. Sanford. loosely applied, and it would be more proper to call it gasping. I am waking up gasping, grabbing at the cold bed sheets remaining where they were once warm. I have a disease spreading, licked hard through my veins, and I'm running in slow motion. And my heart is overexerted, and my lungs are swelling like a child's balloon at the summer fair. My palms are quaking like fault lines, and when he holds them, they quell for a moment, but only a breath's time. I feel my bones racking in want and shrinking in the knowledge of their own inadequacy, I sleep to the tune of his phantom breathing. <laughs> I love when the heartless spent eons ebbing and flowing and learned the long lost art of reef growth. I will give my love with an earnest belief in forever, even though I have lived long years in the valley of broken promises. I will give my heart to ink-eyed boys with poet hands and I will trust the strength of slender shoulders. I will live on the edge and only sleep when I fall, and I will not be afraid of the moment of suspension in the air, and I will yearn for the moment of bones cracking against the valley floor. I have this belief and a desire and a need, and I will hold this world in the concave cavern of my chest and believe that though it spits evil with every indrawn breath, that at the end of the day, the core of it is good. I will turn my cheek to the darkness that has drawn jagged scars down my sloping back, and I will turn my ears and my eyes to the light of the heavens. I will live my life in the pencil sketches I have drawn of this world, and I will believe in the ink of my beliefs. Our feature readers tonight are two people who put me into a bit of a, an enigma, in that uh, I, uh, I know their poetry slightly, and most of what I know about them as poets is by reputation. Uh, in fact, uh, Jennifer Attaway is something of a broken record in our house, because my wife, who's a librarian at BCC, keeps talking about what respect she has for literature, how she inspires her students, etc. Um, I expect them to be totally inspired tonight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer Hadley. Oh, wow. <laughs> so if I wasn't nervous enough, I had to go and do that. No, it's true. Um, I haven't really shared my poetry with many people for years and years, so this is kind of my debut in adulthood. I haven't read since college. Um, before I begin, though, I'd like to thank Peter for inviting me. I'm very honored to be here, and to your wife for <laughs> suggesting it. And I also want to thank all of my colleagues, Perry Nicholas, 
Lisa Wiley, Rick LeClaire, for um, being around me and inspiring me. And thank you, Carol, for being my partner in crime and getting me going on this. So here we go. And I'd also like to say, just because this is a novel thing to say, I had a little nephew born today um, in California, and he was 11 pounds, 6 ounces. Wow. <laughs> and his name is Zachary, so I'm going to dedicate this reading to him. What? And one more thing. Um, because it's the time that my students are working on research papers, and I'm always telling them to give credit where credit's due, I do want to mention that the first three poems I'm going to read are inspired by a lot of the things that I've been reading and stealing from and all that. So the first poem in the series takes its name from Werner Herzog's documentary, Encounters at the End of the World. Um, so I can't take credit for that. And then a lot of the ideas and things are from William James and Heidegger and Emily Dickinson and Marianne Moore and all the things that I've kind of just been reading. So I can't take credit for all the ideas. All right? <laughs> and now we'll begin. The epigraph for this poem is from Susan Howe, one of my teachers in college, from this that, if there is an afterlife, then we still might. If not, not. One, we knew it before we learned the narrow grammar of other than, and almost, and not. We knew it. And so we flew into the unknown, a seemingly endless void, and we broke through again. And so now, here we are. We are language lost in language. How does this mean? Two, how did we get here? How? Or is it why did it happen that we happened to arrive at the same time? This must be some kind of coincidence, or not. This is more than that. But what does that matter? We are here now. This is how this is. Three. So we put our particles together and we are breathing and breathing and breathing this in, and we are dreaming and we are here, where horizons collide and collapse and scatter and dazzle and dazzle and dazzle us, but not gradually, so we are mangled by the magic, tossed into the blue and the white and the blue and the black, then the bright light. Four. My questions about nature are different. Where is it? Is it why? You see, it is more than this or that. It is only a matter of time until. Five. We remember and remember and remember, then forget. It is still among. That and this, a radiant gist, resisting. It thunders, it lightens, it thunders, it lightens. My bones know it, and some place can feel its rumble. Six. They make such insipid claims about black and white magic embedded in the grammar of this language. It is impossible, isn't it? But in the end, it is perfect, exactly as it is, which is as it was and always will be, at least in some way. <laughs> and errand into the wilderness. There is something there. The once true clue, a thing as subtle as a syllable, sends us through an errand into the wilderness. We move between the brown and the blue and the green of it, 
We reach for what is secret, wild, double, and various here. Here, there is nothing. Our roots are inaccessible to us. So close, but so closed. When near is far, the distance is among the stars and very large. Searching the only certain evidence that we are. We search beyond the surface of the sensible world, venture into the original, and in and in. Is not this merging of everything into distanceless more unearthly than everything bursting apart? There is something here. We know it. It is as if, without touch or sight, we feel the light of that which gives life as it is. We see the light inside the light that lights all of it. And even though, there is nothing to say. Here. It is quiet here. Among the eternal silence, there it is, there it is. A riot inside, absolute freedom and wildness. So urgent, it takes everything I have to hold what I know I know, still. Caught and wide awake. Oh, I couldn't, I couldn't. But I should, and I must if I will ever find my ever after this. <laughs> to give myself a break, I'm going to read a poem that I discovered recently, and I love reading it, and it's very entertaining. So if I've bored you so far, I could at least entertain you for a minute. This is by Mary Ruefley. And it's called, because I don't write love poems really, it's called Why I'm Not a Good Kisser. <laughs> because I open my mouth too wide, trying to take in the curtains behind us and everything outside the window, except the little black dog who does not like me. So at the last moment, I shut my mouth. Because Cipriano de Rore was not thinking when he wrote his sacred and secular motets, or there would be only one kind, and this affects my lips in terrible ways. <laughs> because at the last minute, I see a lemon sitting on a gravestone, and that is a thing, a thing that would appear impossible, and the kiss is already concluded in its entirety. Because I learned everything about the beautiful in A Guide to the Weather by Boren Van Loon, so the nature of lenticular clouds and anti-cyclones and several other things dovetail in my mind and at once it strikes me what quality goes to form a good kisser, especially at this moment, and which you possess so enormously. I mean, when a man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, and doubts without me, I am dreadfully afraid he will slip away while my kiss is trying to figure out what to do. <laughs> because I think you will try to read what is written on my tongue, and this causes me to interrupt with questions. A red frock? Red stockings? And the rooster dead? Dead of what? Because of that other woman inside me who knows how the red skirt and red stockings came into my mouth, but persists with the annoying questions leading to her genuine ignorance. Because just when our teeth are ready to hide, I become a quizzling and forget the election results and industrial secrets leading to the manufacture of woolen ice cream cones, changing the futures of ice worms everywhere. <laughs> Can it be that even the greatest kisser ever arrived at his goal without putting aside numerous objections? Because every kiss is like throwing a pair of doll eyes in the air and trying to follow them with your own. However it may be, Oh, for a life of kisses instead of painting volcanoes. Even if my kiss is like a paintbrush made from hairs. Even if my kiss is squawru, which is a scaly herb of the broomrate family, parasitic on oats. 
Even if a sailor went to sea in me, to see what he could see in me, and all that he could see in me was the bottom of the deep dark sea in me. Even though I know nothing can be gained by running, screaming into the night, into the night like a mouth, into the mouth like a velvet movie theater with planets painted on the ceiling, where you will find me, your pod mate, in some kind of beautiful trouble over moccasin stitch number three, which is required for my release. <laughs> <laughs> The ridiculous swagger of the program, after William James. A hint of winter here, some summer too. A little fall, inevitable, like spring, gone before I come. Tell me the whole story. Faith needs what it believes, possible and true, and more often than not, not. Love loves love it does not trust. Some love too loud, some live too small. Leave it alone. A stir. A stir so slight sends it far too far to hold, to frame, far too near, not to try, often, not nearly near enough. And this is um, this one's funny, and it's the the one I'm going to close with because when uh, we were asked to give bios, of course I didn't send them like you said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so the first thing on the poster says a poet, and that's a scary thing for me because I don't like to think of myself like that. So this is called No Poet. When it asked me for a poem, I remembered this advice. Be abstract, and you'll wish you'd been specific. It's a fact. So I showed it the doll's eye, an accident of extravagant affection forced the tiny eye from the plastic socket. A faint pop sent it flying. Sad surprise tried to follow it as it hopped and clipped across the floor into a shadowy corner where it stopped. A lone eye, alert and lidless in the dust. It is there still. It stares and stares and stares at the miracles in the air. And it did not see it. But I am not a poet. Since it asked me to try, I showed it this. And it made off with what I gave it. And that was all it got. <laughs> Yes, you are. Uh, and Lynette was right. <clears throat> Sam McGavin is, a, uh, is an attorney noted for taking up the causes of people who can't defend themselves. He's the author of a celebrated book on Primo Levi. Uh, he's young, dynamic. In other words, everything I'm jealous of. Um, and to make matters worse, I discovered he writes poetry as well. So, uh, without further ado, it's time to go. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for coming. 
So the poems I'm going to read, and I, they're, they're uh, 24 very short poems. And these are ones that, uh, they're all new. And the way I wrote them was, uh, for the past two or three years, I drafted a lot of poems and put them directly into folders and didn't look at them again. And then this fall, I kind of faced up to the task of looking at them all and uh, throwing out you know, about 90% of them and then revising uh, the rest until I had a set of 48. So these are half of the 48 um, that I'm sort of keeping. And uh, the way I chose the 24 to read tonight was partly somewhat arbitrarily, I guess. I decided to pick all poems that have at least one animal in them. Uh, so some, you know, are really about animals and others just have a very glancing reference to animals, but they all involve animals in one way or another. Um, so the first one is Great Northern Loon. And um, if you've ever seen a loon, you know they're very beautiful, and you know they have the very unusual call that uh, gives us the word loony. Uh, but the other thing about them that's very striking is if you've ever seen one take off, it takes like the whole lake before it can get up in the air. You, like you've never seen a bird that seems so much like it's actually not going to take off, uh, and then it uh, you know finally does. It takes the loon so long to lift off from the lake. It flaps and slaps its big awkward wings so violently. I start to think the whole bird is some kind of mistake. And then, at the last minute, it tears out gravity's iron stakes. The next poem, uh, I wrote the first three lines of this poem when I was um, 15 years old, so 33 short years ago. So it only took me 33 years to finish it. Actually, I did finish it when I was 15, but I didn't like the rest of the lines as well. Uh, but I kept those first three, and, and uh, so they reappeared in this poem. Little Icarus things, they flutter and dance to death on a lamp, the hypnotic burning. But don't just sing about their bumbling, battering flights, singed, papery wings. Don't forget the nectar they sip and the flowers serve before they soar at least light. And try and say least light 15 times fast. Uh, and you'll get a prize. So the next poem, uh, I've always tried to think about like Neanderthal man or, or you know, early versions of humans and what their sort of emotional or spiritual life would be like. Uh, so in this poem, I kind of imagine them with these feelings that, you know, you might think of as more sort of characteristically modern, of sort of malaise and angst and that sort of thing. Uh, Neanderthal man. Ooh, woke up Wednesday morning with a cold, heavy weight in his chest, like an icy boulder. He stared at the ashes from last night's fire. Life seemed unbearably tedious. Sure, he could still feel a bit of free song when he chased the woolly mammoth off a cliff. But then came the grueling work of carving it into bloody hunks, lugging them back uphill to the dank cave. He just wanted to stay in bed, lie at his ease, dream about golden daffodils, bobbing and shining in the May breeze. Now the next one, uh, the, the first poem that I ever wrote, probably, was when I was 10 in fifth grade. Uh, and my dad, who's here tonight, may have it like in a sock drawer or something. Um, but it was about a very egotistical, very happy frog. Uh, so I returned to that theme for this poem, The Bullfrog's Boast. Casting aside all false modesty, I'd like to announce that I'm the best singer in this whole mucky bog. And to those critics who compare my arias to a broken bass banjo plucked by a drunk and bone-tired undertaker 
with only one finger, I say, come a little closer, my friend, while I unroll the long, sticky scroll of my flickering tongue. I'll swallow you whole like a buzzing, annoying fly, and then I'll compose for you an elegy so haunting that even the cold-hearted walleye will cry. <laughs> The next poem, The Birth of Icarus, when I wrote it, I really was not thinking about Icarus. I was really just thinking about uh, a baby or a, a child. And uh, it was only after I wrote it that I ended up giving it this title. The stork that brought you all the way from Ethiopia had great shuddering wings, aching from the epic flight. As relieved as she was to let that heavy, squirming bundle drop into the cradle from her long beak, she was sad to leave. She had divined from your cries that you, too, might strain against gravity's short leash. Proteus, you know, is the uh, ancient Greek god, monster figure that can change a shape and in the Odyssey, Menelaus has to wrestle Proteus to try and find out, I think he's trying to find out why the gods are mad at him and won't let him return home. Uh, but it might not be right. Uh, but in this poem, I was imagining Proteus taking human form for a while and uh, getting a day job and settling down, but then that not lasting forever. Proteus, how he tried to stay oneself to keep whole and stationary as a jar of lard on a dark pantry shelf. Took a job as an assistant clerk in the irrigation department, married a girl from Smyrna, <laughs> learned all his lines by heart. And then one day, as he lay in the hammock in the backyard, lazily watching the wind tug of wispy clouds apart, he felt his blood cool tongue start to fork and flicker, skin get shiny and metallic. Of course, he couldn't stay. He slid away. <laughs> so the next poem is about eels, but it's kind of also about my love of Wikipedia, uh, because I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure that all the facts in here pretty much I got by just wikipedia in eels. Uh, and, you know, it's like, kind of a poem already, just the Wikipedia entry. Uh, Aristotle was wrong about them. Not born of worms out of the guts of wet soil, but long, thin, bony fish hiding in their holes all day, then coming out to hunt at night. They can swim in damp grass or tunnel 30 miles through sand and dirt or pile themselves up in thousands to lurch over obstacles. Londoners eat them jelly. The Basques prefer them deep fried. I won't consume them because I'm no cannibal. Yes, I'm part meal myself, a darkly slithering script, obscure, unstoppable. <laughs> Now this one is about um, the Greek fertility gods, but imagined as sort of giving a speech maybe, I was thinking maybe like, this is after the fact, but as I was thinking about it more recently, I was imagining maybe like at a Rotary Club function or something like that, uh, where they're the featured speakers. Uh, and so this is what one of, one of them at least has to say. People! Go forth and fructify. Slather your naked bodies with wild clover honey. Moo like cows and snort like horse horses. Surrender to warm forces. People, let me explain. Death is radically self-sufficient, self-absorbed, and needs nothing from you. It's we who can't survive, much less thrive, without your glad labors. So don't waste these magic words I've just sung. Crush them like red berries between palate and strong, agile, tasting tongue.
I have a, a recurring, recurring character uh, that I put into different poems named Rabbi Simon. He's, um, some to me, maybe is a rabbi. Uh, I also wrote a novel where he turns out to be a law professor, uh, so he has kind of different incarnations. Uh, but this is his kind of thoughts on, on angels. Rabbi Simon's angels. Some are addicted to heroin. Many have bad teeth. A certain portion are bankers. Some make ads for canned soup. Really, they have nothing in common except for their wings. Huge, but fragile, like a moth, singed from battering bare folds. Now, the problem is that if you live in the Buffalo area, or maybe anywhere in New York State, when you say the word huge, you think about really <laughs> huge hello of uh, car ads. So, luckily in other parts of the country, maybe I'll say that otherwise. Now, the next one is um, uh, based on the part in the Odyssey where Odysseus goes down to the underworld and he talks with Achilles, and Achilles tells him, more or less, if I remember right, that it's um, and, he, and, and Achilles is in, like, you know, it's not like he's in the tormented death part of Hades, uh, like Sisyphus or somebody. He's in, like, in the, the land of the blessed where things are supposed to be good. But even so, he says to Odysseus that it would be better to be the slave of the worst master on earth than to be the prince or king of, of Hades. Uh, so this is like a variation on that theme. Achilles said, it's better to be a cruel arthritic dog catcher. Better to be the mangy old dog he's chasing down the street. Even the tiny flea in the mangy fur giving the old dog grief than to be a prince in Elysium dead as a brown crumpled leaf. <laughs> Golden daffodils. Don't be afraid of the worms. Sure, the transitional period is smelly, disgusting, and vile. But in the long run, who wants to be a mummy? Intact, but waxy and desiccated, a bad joke version of your live self. When you can be chewed and, yes, excreted into good, dark, rich, nutritious earth, Food for daffodils. <laughs> this next poem I had the kind of premise for in my head that I wanted to have a King Midas who, when he touches things, he touches gold and metal and other things like that, and they turn to mortal, frail things. So I had that premise, and it, it took me a lot of attempts to, um, to get to this version. For some reason, when I took out punctuation, it, it helped uh, get to King Midas in reverse. And you'll see in the second stanza, there's kind of a little bit of an echo of, of uh, Yeats sailing to Byzantium with the gold birds. And then that's going to show up again in a, in a later poem, so I'll talk about it a bit more later. Wednesday, when I went strolling in the palace gardens, my robe's fringe happened to brush the golden statue of General Clymestes. Next thing you know, he had leapt down and cantered off on his black horse. You could smell its steaming hide, acrid and sour. Last night, I must have barely breathed upon the precious gold bird my artisans had hammered out and encrusted with rare jewels. Now, just look at her dusty, dusky, reddish-brown breast, heaving with strain as a bent warble escapes her thin beak and she warms the eggs in her nest. <coughs> King David, I think, nowadays he's, people think probably most often of David and Goliath, um, which I do mention here, but I've always sort of been more interested in, in King David, in, uh, other parts of his story, uh, especially uh, the story of King David and Bathsheba. And if you recall, when he falls in love with Bathsheba, she's married to Uriah the Hittite. And so to get rid of Uriah, 
uh, he sends him off to war and tells the general to put him in the front lines so he gets killed, which works. And then uh, Bathsheba is all for King David. Uh, but the other part about King David that I'm most interested in is the fact that in the, in, in the tradition, he's the author of all the Psalms. King David's Psalms. Now that I'm 48, my shoulder aches where Goliath wrenched it. My brain flakes like a rusty iron sword. And when I recall what I did to Uriah, my heart quakes. But thank God my pen still glides across the blank page cool, fluid, and elusive as a green snake. So you've probably heard, the, I don't know what to call it exactly, but the notion that uh, if you put enough monkeys in enough, with enough typewriters, they'll write Hamlet. Uh, so I did further research on the uh, scientific issue, the Hamlet project. Everyone understands by now that if you put enough monkeys and enough typewriters for enough time, eventually they'll produce Hamlet. The more interesting question, which I research, is how, after typing that last period, they'll feel. Bobo and Rafa, I'm certain, won't even notice, grooming each other for ticks. <laughs> Twinkie, I know, will strut and boast as if he were the new king. In fact, of all of them, I think only Bessie, might get an inkling that they've made something as durable as steel and fragrant as wild geranium. <laughs> so, uh, when, I was, uh, when I was little, my mother used to um, frequently tell me about uh, when I was in first grade and I came home from a day from school and I said, oh, mom, this, uh, this lady came to school today, or came into our class, and, and she made us say all these different words. And my mom said, oh, like what words? And I said, well, like, you know, rubber and rugged and rascal and bicycle. And uh, so it was the speech uh, therapist. And so when I said bicycle, I got referred to speech classes to learn to say my S's. And so you can see in this poem uh, whether it worked or not, because it's a fairly challenging poem for a lisper. <clears throat> Medusa's head. The snakes slithered and spit. They were truly hideous, signing the air with a scrawling, sprawling, slick script, hissing their sibilant, sibylline syllables. <laughs> but when Perseus severed her head, when she was finally dead, out of her gushing neck sprang the winged white horse, Pegasus. How could beauty be born from something so evil and revolting? Our ink is what monsters play. <laughs> the Devilus has sort of two points of reference. One is the Greek myth about Icarus and Devilus, and Devilus being the master craftsman and scientist who uh, built the labyrinth that the Minotaur lived in before he made the wings for him and Icarus. Uh, but then the other reference is to Joyce, uh, who of course had the character Stephen Douglas, and Joyce had a famous line about uh, cunning and silence and exile that I make reference to. So there's a little bit of um, my feelings about Joyce in this, which more or less are that I don't really like his work a whole lot, even though I think it's very brilliant. I kind of find him to be a bit of a cold fish in the end. Uh, so that's a bit of what this is about, but it's also about anyone who's ever worked hard and made something really intricate and beautiful in a way, but that it turns out not to really live, which, you know, everyone, every creative person, I think, has had that experience. Daedalus. It's possible to build a fish instead of the usual routine of catching it out of the dark sea. I did it. In the cunning silence of my exile, I made this glittering thing, painstakingly layering scale upon shining scale, with no tools but needle and thread, and my brilliant la labyrinthine brilliant head. I made a perfect fish, but it is cold and dead. 
Now, I've always wanted to have a character in a novel who's an anthropologist who makes up the tribe that he studies and then just uh, gets to have the tribe, you know, be whatever he, whatever, whatever he wants, and then, you know, things more or less like that have happened, although not quite so extreme. Uh, so in this one, I made up a, a tribe called the Yanomapati, but it is true that it is fairly common in diff some different tribal societies, and, and uh, I know uh, some of the tribes in Siberia believe that your soul can fly out of your nose when you sneeze, so I did not make that part up. Um, and it really did happen to me, that part is also true. Uh, Yanomapati. The Yanomapati still believe that the soul may fly out of your nose when you sneeze. I agree. It happened to me. And then it drifted away on the mild May breeze, dissolved into tiny particles by the sun. Now I find it everywhere, but rarely, scattered like pollen, dust, drifting onto wet petals, clinging to the bee's knees. <laughs> Farmer Brown is another uh, character that I kind of return to now and again. And he farms different things, depending on the poem. But in this one, he's a pig farmer. Farmer Brown's pigs. None of my pigs is as piggy as the word pig. Some are too lean, and some are too chaste. Some spurn my slop. Some love to bathe. What's a poor pig farmer to do? I stumble back into the house sit in my big pink chair, and read poems, stories, novels about pigs until my animal spirits are restored. Then I call Mrs. Brown, put on a phonograph, and we chuckle and squeal and dance a merry jig. <laughs> the earthworm. Pink and slimy, how you struggle as you wriggle through dirt. The ancient scoliast defines you as a defiler of corpses and minion of Hades. But I know you toil too for Father Zeus, introducing air, tiny bits of heaven, into the black soil. This next one is the, the other one that uh, this one refers very explicitly to Yeats and sailing to Byzantium. And so I have Professor Blomquist, who has got three recurring characters, the professor, the rabbi, and the farmer. And someday I'll make up a series of um, jokes about the professor, the rabbi, and the farmer. Uh, but so far they've all stayed in separate poems. Uh, but this is uh, Professor Blomquist feels kind of about uh, about Yeats's poem, <laughs> Professor Blomquist's Ornithology. When you get old, cold, fat, and achy, you easily understand why W.B. Yeats longed to be a hammered gold bird on a golden perch. But truth be told, I'd rather be this house sparrow, brown, drab, common, invasive, than even the most lovely mechanical thing. Look at him. Oblivious to the snow, the brutal chill, the cheapness of a chirp, he sings. So back to Greek myth, this one about um, Orion, the famous singer who, I forget if you remember, does he fall or he gets pushed off the ship? I can't remember how that part happens, but he ends up in the water and then the dolphin saves him. And, and nudges him to shore, so I was thinking of like, what was that like for the dolphin? That seemed like uh, such a kind of uh, strange feeling it must be to nudge this human thing for, you know, miles to shore. So that's what I wrote about. He was large and lumpy and bony, yet soft, dressed in a long golden gown that was perfect for drowning. And he clutched his big lyre as if it were a life preserver, not a millstone. What a stupid chore, nudge him with my sleek snout 22 miles to shore. I probably would have stopped and let him drop down to the sea's dark floor, were it not for that small, uncanny song he made. 
it echoed in my brain's coiled core. The psychopomp is a very strange word. It doesn't really mean what it sounds like it might mean, like a pompous psycho, psych, psychotic person. It means the, um, the god or spirit uh, who leads people to the land of the dead. And that's one of the roles that Hermes has in Greek mythology. Hermes the Psychopomp. We followed the 18 mile creek all the way to the lake. The frigid water made our ankles ache. A great blue heron led us, flying, perching, rising again, with uncanny, flapping, awkward grace. As we hope Hermes will take us to the land of the dead, winged sandals shining, fluttering on his feet, a lopsided smile on his face. The Flea Circus. It's not so easy to tell when the lyric gift is dead. You can't hold a shining mirror up to a poem's lips and check for breath. The old ringmaster always said, better to be a live flea than a dead elephant. Fickle muse, when the show is over, when the magic circus folds its tent, grant me the grace not to blather. Keep me silent. And the footnote for my last poem is that uh, our daughters had a teacher, fourth grade teacher, who, for vocabulary, I think both of them, uh, was it both of them? Both, for both girls, uh, one of the vocabulary words they got in fourth grade from Miss uh, Patty Pastula was coruscate. Uh, which I didn't know what it meant, and I thought it was such a funny vocabulary word to give fourth graders. It means shine or glitter. Uh, so that kind of gave me the urge to try and put it in a poem. And uh, then I, I think I just looked in the dictionary and found out that coruscant is the adjective form of it. So then I decided to try and, and work that into a poem. And eventually it did, uh, it did work out. Uh, the only other thing, the only other footnote I'll say is, uh, Nick, you know, could mean like, you know, to nick something, uh, can also mean to steal it. So there's kind of a pun on Nick in the poem. The Burglar of Light. <coughs> I'm trying to pick the lock before night envelops us all in its great sack of lack. I drop my skeleton key into the snowbank, despairing. I plunged my hand into that icy heap. It burst back up, exultant as a shiny black cormorant, clutching the coruscant knick knack. <laughs> Thank you. having heard George Carol Oates and uh, she said one of the, the, the difference between reading your poetry and having someone read your poetry is that when you're reading it no one knows when it's going to end uh, so they, they sort of just sit there waiting and waiting uh, and then when it ends you know, there's almost a burst of applause uh, <clears throat> not because it's over but because uh, there, there was that tension that builds up not knowing where it was, go where it was going and Sam, of course, did what Joyce Carol Oates said should, should be done. She held up her poem to show him how long it was. <laughs> we all had these, so we knew where we were going, and we waited till the end to, to apply. And it was very well deserved applause. So I just uh, wanted to once again give some recognition to both our readers tonight. I'd like to read. Our next reading in February, you have to be here because it, that's not going to happen on any regular basis. I mean, it's likely you won't see another reading like it for another four years uh, because it's on the, on February 29th. Uh, so that's uh, that's Martha and Rick, Rick and Claire, and Martha B. Yes. What's happening December 12th at the Crane Library? I said that earlier. Okay. 
I, I did make an announcement that Carol and I, just in case somebody missed it, Carol and I, Carol Southman and I, are reading at the Crane Library on December 12th at 7 yeah. o'clock. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.